Everybody, if we can stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Good evening. All right, so this is our first meeting of our newly elected board. Um, so welcome back to all us old timers who were reelected, but we'd like to welcome Jessica, who is one of our new board members, and also Jeff, who's the other new board member. Welcome along. Unfortunately, you get thrown right in the fire this evening um, because we start right off the bat with budget budgets, and we are starting those tonight, and so yeah, we don't ease you in here on the Board of Education. We're right, right to the get-go. So welcome. Um, and please, as I told you each individually, if you have questions, ask, ask, ask. Because we will sometimes, who, since we know this stuff, we'll just keep going. And if you don't know what we're talking about, stop us and ask, please. Um, we will move on to item B. With every new, uh, with every time we have an election in town, we need to reelect our leadership on the Board of Education. So this is our first meeting after our election. So we need to um, re-vote on the position of chairman, vice chairman, and secretary. Um, so I'm going to hand that over to John Batista, who is going to handle that too, so for neutrality purposes. Great, thank you. Ben. <laughs> so the first uh, position we're going to vote on and elect is for chairman. So let's start with the nominations. Does anyone like to put a nomination on the floor? I'd like to nominate Donna Lane for chairman. Session. Session. Any other nominations from the floor? Okay. That being said, no nominations. Uh, we have a first and a second. Any discussion? Okay, so let's vote. Um, uh, Chairman Donald, for voting for Chairman for Donald Lane, all those in favor? Passion now, so great. Thank you. So now we are looking for nominations for Vice Chair. Any nominations on the floor? I'd like to nominate George King for Vice Chair. A second? Second. Second. Appreciate that. Great, thank you. We will move on to the consent agenda. Do I have a motion to approve? Thank you. Do I have a second, Jerry? Any discussion on the consent agenda? All right, hearing none, all in favor? Great, thank you, motion passes. We will move on to our reports of our committees and liaisons. Before I start, our committee assignments um, will be our next meeting, so that will be on the 18th. Um, so we will have the list out to everybody, so start thinking of the committees, or if you just stay, want to stay on the same committee you're on. Um, Massick st student reps. Um, this Wednesday, we will have the World Language Honor Society um, induction. It is for students who have been uh, committed to world language for, I think it's all four years, and um, have gotten good grades in those classes. Um, there will be a food drive going on through our advisory classes. Um, going on this week and next week, um, and it's designed to help families in need during the holiday season. Um, our football team made it to the state championship um, after a win this Sunday against New Canaan, um, and they will play against Daniel Hand, who we unfortunately lost to in the soccer championship a few weeks ago, but we're looking for payback. Um, it'll be at 11 o'clock a.m. Um, at Veterans Stadium in New Britain. So. <coughs> Uh, Mass will be having a blood drive tomorrow. Uh, this uh, this Thursday there will be an early dismissal for uh, an eighth grade open house, um, which uh, staff come back and uh, they promote programs stuff like that. I know uh, my uh, my teacher Mrs. Crino, Mrs. Cleany, you may know. Uh, she wants me to come for DECA and. Uh, FBLA comes and all the clubs for Massa come for eighth grade orientation and kind of advertise ourselves and show all that Massa has to offer these kids uh, and pers prospective students. Uh, and also, there's going to be a band concert next Thursday at 7 p.m. in the auditorium. Um, 
This past Saturday, there was a huge robotics competition at Massick, and there were 55 teams across all of New England that uh, competed. There were 1,000 students here, and it was all organized by Mr. McDonough and the uh, 14 Massick robotics teams that span across both the high school and the middle school. Um, winter sports are now underway as the majority of the tryouts were conducted this past weekend. And finally, um, throughout all lunch waves this mon uh, today and tomorrow, FBLA uh, had their miracle minute where uh, members of the club run around the uh, lunchroom and try to collect any donations they can, which go straight to St. Jude's Hospital. Great, thank you, and you guys can take off. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Does anybody else have any committee reports this evening? All right, hearing none, we will move on to public participation. Mm -hmm. Seeing none, we will move on to the report of the superintendent. Okay, well, before we start the, the budget presentation, there is <clears throat> one thing that I wanted to share with you. And this is about Medicaid um, reimbursements. Um, this says Medicare, but it is Medicaid reimbursements. The budget, the governor's budget, I'm sorry, the state budget that was just passed has a provision that all boards of education must submit um, Medic for Medicare reimbursement for students who qualify. <clears throat> In the past, Monroe hasn't really done that because there really wasn't m much for us to um, apply for. But now it's part of the state law. So uh, Kay Moser, our director of uh, student support services, has done some investigation, talked to a lot of area schools, and there really are two ways to do this. The first one is um, called Frontline, and it's through our IEP system, and it seems like the bigger districts do this. And our staff inputs the data, and then through the program that we have to purchase um, and training, we can submit the Medicare I'm sorry, Medicaid um, payment. What we found out is that the first year it cost $8,500 to set it up and for two days worth of training. And then every year after that is $7,000. Now, if you're a big district and you get tens of thousands of dollars towards that, that's probably a good deal. Um, what we also discovered is that a sm smaller districts are using something called CompuClaim. And CompuClaim, we give CompuClaim the information <clears throat> they put the information into a program and then we they give us a report to submit to the state um, what they do is take 11 percent of whatever we get back so for us we feel the second choice is probably the best choice since we don't know how much we're going to get back we certainly don't think we're going to get back enough to the first year to cover that cost and then in the years coming if we feel that we're getting more back and it would be more advantageous to us to do the 8500 and the 7000 a year we can always do that but right now because we don't know how much we're getting back we would um, we want to go forward with the CompuClaim, claim the 11 percent of whatever it is we get back so there's no real no real problem for us because if we only get back a thousand dollars they're only going to take 11 percent of the thousand dollars so that's why i'd like to move forward but just like to see if you have any questions or comments about that um, that, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. So, and we'll keep you informed on how much we get back, and then if it's for some reason a lot of money, mm -hmm. it might be more advantageous to mm -hmm. us to do the uh, the eight thousand dollars. But right now we'll go. With it. Mm -hmm. And how much time does it take to enter all this stuff in? Uh, we have to have parent permission mm -hmm. first. So until we get that back, we don't even know how many kids will be participating, and we, it's so unknown to us. I don't know how long it's going to take. But we're going to keep that on all that, so just we know. We'll right. Go but pretty quick. Will CompuSign enter the information for you? No, because they need our data. So you have to enter it to get but to that. But CompuSign? CompuSign comes and trains the staff on how to enter it into the system, and then it's all done for CompuSign. Okay. It's not the secretary of ours that has to sit and kind of go through all that. It's the, our secretary who does I that. I use both of them. It's pretty quick. Okay. And what happens if the parent doesn't give permission for it? You can't file for that child. Okay. Well, I, I'm curious to see if it even yields anything. Right, and we'll, and we'll know that uh, probably. We might, probably won't know this year because we're not doing a full year. We will not be actually enrolled until after January. Um, so we'll probably know this year because we will have a half year mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for that. And so now we're going to uh, present the budget. And um, 
Jack and I are going to sit over there because we're going to put everything up on the screen and we're going to start with the executive summary and share that with you. As we've said so many times, this process is a long process. We started this right in the beginning of October when we met with everyone. And, and we have been really working on this budget every week since that time. Um, and so now what we're going to present to you is our estimate of the operating budget um, for 2018-19. Jack and I were part of building this budget. We did it together. Um, and actually, the other people behind us were also part of the budget. But once we got all the information from all our, um, our, you know, the leadership from behind, Jack and I sat down with Gabby and we put together this budget. So since we put it together and since Jack's going to live with the budget, we thought we would present it together. Um, so that's why we're both here and uh, we will present it with you. So we built this budget always thinking of the students. And I know that's a cliche, but that's truly what happened. As we were thinking about what we needed in this budget, as we were thinking about what we needed to go forward, we always had the end in mind. And for us, the end in mind is producing students that can um, participate in post-high school um, education if they want, to go to the world of work and be prepared for that. So the, we started with the end in mind. And we were, doing, we were putting things in the budget that we thought that would ensure the success of our students. You know this mission statement? We live it. And actually, we, when we make a decision in the district, we go back to this mission statement and the goals and action plans that we'll talk about later. But we go to those areas because if it doesn't meet our mission, we're not going to go forward with it. So we want our students to be innovative thinkers. We want to deliver the best inquiry-based curriculum um, that our teachers can give, that our, these teachers are skilled, that they're dedicated, and they're um, engaged. And that's what we want our students to be able to come out with when they're done. Our educational goal is to provide the support for all students to graduate and be and have college and career ready skills and you've heard that all across the, the, the country but in Monroe as you can see from what we from our awards from where our students go after high school it's really working and we know I've been here a long time we want to be fiscally responsible we want to make sure that we're spending reasonably and responsibly so that our students needs are met and so that's what this budget does so to John's last point, we want to give you a history of spending here in the Monroe Public Schools. If you look at this uh, chart we have on the screen, this is a history of the last 10 years of uh, spending increases in education. I want to highlight the last seven years from 11-12 uh, through 17-18. Within those seven years, there were three zeros and all of the other increases remained below 2%. Consistent with that, the proposed increase for this year is 1.84%. This next chart shows you CPI, which is the Consumer Price Index. This is a measure of inflation. It comes out October 1 every single year. And that is these, the red line that you see here. And then the blue line that you see is our spending increases over the past years. And what you'll note here again in this last seven years is that our spending increases have remained below CPI every year with the exception of one year here in 15, 16, we're about a half percent above CPI that year. But other than that one exception, we've remained below that consumer price index every single year. As you can see in last year, that uh, the delta or the difference between our increase at zero and the consumer price index was a full 2%. The reason why that's relevant is that it, our dollars need to stretch further when that exists. When we remain below CPI, we have to expend monies uh, to pay for the same goods and services as everybody else. At home, when our oil prices go up an additional 2%, we don't have a choice. We have to pay that additional 2%. So when we're flat, we have to find ways to uh, make up for that 2%, and we'll highlight some of the things that we're doing to stretch dollars and be as fisc fiscally responsible as we possibly can. There are two revenue streams that come to either the town or the district for education, and they're, they're confusing, so I really wanted to take a few minutes to kind of discuss this. 
Last year, when at the end of the year, when the governor presented his budget, there were some things in that that really worried school systems, as you well know, we've been living with that. So the educational cost share grant, the ECS grant, in the past was over $6 million, but the governor proposed that we would get cut. And so the town, the Board of Finance, s projected a $3 million educational cost share, ECS grant, um, that we would get, that Monroe would get. And that money, that ECS money, goes directly to the town. The excess cost grant, which is the special ed grant, um, the governor increased our excess cost grant to $1.5 million. <laughs> So when we built the current budget that we're living in, we built it with the lower educational cost share, the ECS grant, and the higher excess cost special ed grant. We built that into the budget. Well, what happened once the budget passed, a couple of things happened. Instead of the projected three million ECS cost, ECS grant, we, we actually got 5.5 million. So we got more on that side. But instead of the $1.5 million for the excess cost special ed grant, we only got 871. dollars So you can see the difference. The difference in 1718 is the town received over $2.5 million more than they thought, but we, the educational um, special ed grant, the excess cost grant, we were $628,000 less. So what happened when the town created a budget is that they created a contingency, a million dollar contingency, and we are going to request that that million dollar contingency cover our $628,000 um, shortfall. Now, again, we believe that that could happen. We're going to request that. And so we're, we built that budget with that in mind. <clears throat> so when you're, when you're used to that 1.84%, that includes the $628,000 that we were less in the excess cost grant because we're going to, we believe we'll get that back um, from the contingency. I know that, that was very really confusing, but that's, uh, those are the two revenue streams that we just wanted to share and tell you what we're thinking as we're going through this budget. So with that cut, with that governor's cut, there was a million dollar cut to the Board of Ed. So this year, one central office administrator was cut, two nurses, both of which we could live without because the students weren't here in the closing of St. Jude's. There was a bus that was cut. We cut a high school teacher. Those three K-5 subject area coordinators that I've talked about forever, um, math, language arts, and science, were cut. We cut professional development. That means professional development throughout the summer didn't happen, and we still had some cuts during the year. And we cut curriculum writing. Again, didn't happen over the summer, and we cut some during the year. That's what, um, what was happening. We were hoping that the million-dollar contingency that was coming back, we could bring some of these programs back. But because of that cut in the special ed grant, we're going to have to use that contingency to fill that hole. <clears throat> so that's where we are now. Um, and I've said this before, and I'll, I'll say it to whoever will listen to me, that those uh, subject area coordinators, not really a problem this year. We've kind of gone through that. But if we don't put those subject area coordinators, those K-5 subject areas are not going to have the consistency that they need. That's not going to happen after the second year and the third year. They really. They work with the state. They know what's happening with the state. They bring it to the teachers. All the new ideas that come up, we're just starting the next generation science standards. Those K-5 coordinators bring that to the elementary schools. And the same thing with professional development. I think of professional development as research and development. Companies spend a huge percentage of their budget on research and development. We spend a small amount on professional development. Again, not a problem this year, but as we go through the years and we don't get that professional development money back, we're going to see a definite change. <clears throat> so the parameters for the budget. Sorry, um, what did we what did we want to do? Well, we wanted to fund. We we seek the funds to support our mission and vision. And and, and again, you know what our mission is. You helped write it uh, five years ago. Class size does matter. Um, this and and we keep a real appropriate class size in elementary school especially and we go up so class size matters to us you know we have core academics and that's very important but we know that's supported by our electives and our co-curricular programs so we wanted to keep that in mind as we did that and if we have to reduce and we did have to reduce as you can imagine when the principals and the directors came to us this budget was a little bit different than 1.84 as you can well imagine 
Um, so we worked with them to get it down to a, a reasonable, what we felt was a reasonable number, and we tried to make those changes that affect the fewest amount of students. We, we didn't want that to happen. Okay, so here's the budget overview. Now we have these expense categories, and we're going to go through those during our uh, budget workshops, but I just wanted to highlight a few of them so that you can see where that 1.84% came from. So the first thing I want to, um, to, to show you is that salary and benefits, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. That's where m much of the increase happened in those salaries and benefit lines. And again, those are contractual, and those benefits, you, know, you, you, you live it in your world, and we live it in our world, those benefits are, are, are high. Um, the special ed instruction. We're down 10% in special ed, and that's because of the hard work of that department. Um, that, that reduction comes from public tuition, which there were five students who are no longer in public, not in Monroe. They're no longer in out-of-district public institutions. They're back in Monroe. Um, so that's five students for that. And the other is private students, uh, private tuition. We, you know, as we had the special ed uh, program, that our, some of our students are in private placements. Some of that happens before they got here and they moved in and we had to continue those private places. Sometimes it's, a, uh, it's just a, a, a happens through a PPT and those students in private placements. Um, next year we're able to bring back, we're able to have three less students in private placements. Two are coming back in the district. So that saved about 10%. And if you were here last year, you know that that was a big cost um, last year to our budget. So we're very happy with how that worked out. The other thing I wanted to show you is under other, it says 23% uh, increase, that's $48,000. That's a truck that we need to buy as part of our, ca our, capital, um, our, ca our capital replacement program that Jack's gonna talk about at the end. But that whole thing has to do with, that whole increase has to do with a truck. That's actually 55,000, but uh, we've saved some money in other places, so that's why it's a $48,000 increase. And then the Honeywell lease payment. Now Honeywell is, there are two different um, payments in Honeywell. One is a payment that we'll be going to be paying for the next four years, and it's I think $300,000, $301,000. But then we had this loan that um, CLMP at the time gave us called a Pura loan, which helped pay for some of those Honeywell projects. Um, and that's going to be, that's paid off. So that's why that's a savings of $45,000. So that's what you see. If you go to the next slide, this is a, a graph representation of what we're talking about. Look at the blue and the red. That's um, salary and benefits. That's over 80% of the budget is salary and benefits. We're a people business. We're not making widgets. We, can't, we don't need to buy um, materials to make something. We're a people business to educate students, so 80% of the budget is, um, is, is salary and benefits. And then you can see the other little parts that... Um, that make up the budget, and you can see the like the percentage of, of, of pictorial graph uh, representation of that. You know, transportation costs are there, and that's an X. And then you can see special ed and energy things like that. <clears throat> so here are some highlights. When we think about this budget, um, we think about what is it we want to highlight. What is it we want you to know about this budget? And so here's here here are the highlights. We have reduced our staff by 3.5 full-time equivalents. That's what FT stands for, 3.5 full-time equivalents for certified staff. That means we've cut one and a half staff members next year at Massac High School, and we, we believe we could do that because of enrollment. We cut one from Jackie Hollow and one from Monroe Well. Again, all because of uh, student reductions. We've cut 1.5 non-certified staff. That's a one. <laughs> Um, custodian at the high school and we believe that's because of the turf field where it's less maintenance it's taking less time to manage that turf field so we were able to cut one custodian at Massac High School for that and the point five is a half-time secretary at the central office we're going to reduce um, the amount of time uh, that we're going to use at central office um, and part of that is we've cut a, an administrator up there last year and we think we can do it with, um, with what the staff that we have there. Um, you know, medical and dental increase is 400000 I have to be honest. I'm a little worried about that. We put that placeholder in. I'm not sure that's going to be enough. But we had to put a placeholder in. That's where we are. We'll know more in February. Um, we see a better trend. Not 
you know, Gabby's not jumping up and down about that yet, but we do see a better trend. So we're hoping that of that $400,000 increase insurance will cover that. That includes that $301,000 for the Honeywell lease payments. Again, in four years, Gabby, right? Four years, we said? Uh, 22, 23. Fiscal 23, should be over. That'll be over. Um, and, and Jack's going to show you really what we benefited from that Honeywell project. Um, you know, there are contractual salary increases that we've all negotiated. There is a one-ton plow truck in the operating budget because we don't want to get to the point where we have, you know, two trucks or three trucks that need to be. We want to replace it on a schedule so that, um, and, and this is the next truck. It's $55,000. We are reinstating two of the three K-5 coordinators in this budget. Now, why two of the three? Well, of course, we would, we would want to replace all three, but again, we're trying to be fiscally responsible. Sheila Castanelli, who is the K-12 curriculum director um, in the district, has a, um, an English background, um, was a principal in elementary school, has the English language arts background. So she's going to take the role of the K-5 English language arts coordinator, and then we're going to hire the math and the science. We have reinstated three of the elementary technology paraeducators that were out of the budget as part of that million dollar cut. We are seeing some holes in technology, um, and so we're hoping that that, that that's $45,000 or $55,000. We're hoping that having those technology paraeducators back, we can fill some of those holes that are there. And the other thing is $20,000 for social worker hours. Now that's new in the budget. We, we haven't had that before, but we are finding more and more families with needs. And the town has a social worker that's a part-time social worker and, and she's helped and she's, and she's um, really collaborated with our, our, our school, but it's really not enough. And we're seeing more and more and more families who, need, need, who have needs. And so we're asking for $20,000, which is a .2 FTE, to include in the budget so that we can have some time for a social worker to meet those high need families. So that's what's in this budget also. And then again, the state grants continue to be uncertain. The ECS grant, although the budget told us what we're going to get next year, uh, I don't think anybody really believes it yet. Um, so we're, it's uncertain, so we're worried about the grant, but we're going to go with what we think it's going to be next year. So in this slide, you see our enrollment over time. And I want to call your attention to the uh, most recent three years there where you see the uh, enrollment flatten out. Back in 2015, when Mylona McBroom completed the demographic study for us, they actually predicted that in this year we would be 136 students less than we currently are. So what we're starting to see here is rather than this downward trend, which has continued for quite a few years, we're seeing that that trend, at least in the last three years, is, is changing, that it's flattening out, and we're seeing um, a more consistent number of students within our schools. Related to that, this slide shows you grade level by grade level our student enrollment uh, across um, the K-12 uh, continuum here. Uh, there are just two grades I want to call to your attention. One is grade K for 2018. That has to be a projection. We don't know how many students we're going to have in grade K next year, so that is taken straight from the Milone and McRoom demographic study. And then also the other projection is uh, Massac ninth grade. Um, one of the things with high schools is that students have a lot of choices when they go off to high school, whether it be vocational programs or the like. Uh, one of the interesting things about Massac is we retain a lot of students. We retain 90 plus percent of our students who come to Massac. It's really a very good percentage. A lot of other districts, it's significantly less than that. So I think it speaks very well for the, the quality of programming we have here. All of the other grade levels that you see are, are taken straight from the year before. So those are actual numbers in the pipeline. Um, no, no changes up or down. Those are, those are solid numbers looking into the future. And those are the October 1st actual numbers. And as you know, those are the numbers that the state tells us to use, so October 1st. Our numbers have increased since October 1st because we've had kids move in, but we're using the October 1st to be consistent, October 1st to October 1st. The next chart shows you uh, some information about middle school enrollment. One of the questions we get often is uh, when will STEM move back to the main campus at Jockey Hollow? So we put together a graph that gives you some good information about how things look moving into the future. 
So to John's point here for 1718, the current school year, October 1, these are our actual enrollments K through 12, and this connects directly uh, back to the previous slide that you just saw. In grades seven and eight, that's a summation of students in those grades, 786 students. Now that's red for a reason. Capacity at Jockey Hollow is 700 students. There was a time when we had a little more than 700 in that building, but when we did that, we had to bring in other lockers and programming has changed since the time that was done. So bringing students back over 700 would mean a reduction in some of the programming that's offered. And it would also mean a, re a reduction in the quality of services for students in terms of fitting them all into the building. So at that threshold of 700, we can follow this chart and if we go to looking at the current five, six, seven students, when they are in six, seven, eight, the following year, that gives us a total of 727 students still in the red. Following year for 1920, our current four, five, six students, they'll be in six, seven, eight in uh, 1920. So we have 709, we're getting closer. It's yellow for a reason. We do see, as John mentioned, we do have students moving in. So that number could become red or if we have some move out, it could become green. It's an unknown at this point and something we'll need to keep our eyes on. Whereas you really see a shift now as we get into 2021. Uh, again, using actual numbers within our district, we'll be at 677, which if things remain that way, would be comfortably within that 700 uh, threshold to be able to fit all students back into the main campus at that point in time. And then if you follow it for the successive years, we remain below that threshold, so we'd be able to sustain keeping all students within one campus at that point. So since 2008-9, we have lost 891 students. So the question is always, well, you lose, your enrollment's gone down, what's happened with the staff? So certified staff, you can see, since 2008-9, we have reduced our certified staff by 53.6 certified staff members. And the same thing with non-certified. We've reduced it by 17.78. You know, people say, well, when you lose 25 students, you should be able to cut a teacher. Or if you have 25 students in a row, you should only, you know, you should only increase it by one teacher. But it never really works out that way. If that were the case, 891 students divided by 25, um, 20, 25 students in a classroom, a class size, we should have only reduced it by 35 teachers. But again, it doesn't work that way. We look at the best way to, um, you know, to gain savings and where we need them and where we don't need them. So this, this chart really just talks about the decrease in the number of staff members as our students have decreased. We've, we've done that. And you know, non-certified has been less of a decrease, but you know, those non-certified paraeducators or, or um, uh, intervention tutors or speech assistants really help our students stay in the district. So it hasn't reduced as much because we're using them more effectively, we think, um, to keep our students in our district. So relative to the last slide, this is a, a, a graphic uh, version of what you were looking at before. So this is our certified staff members in red here, our certified staffing rate over time. And then the blue shows you our student enrollment over time. So what you can see, uh, to John's point, is we have made cuts to our teaching staff proportionately over time. And we're looking to do that in a way where we're maintaining good class sizes and also uh, ensuring that we're being fiscally responsible so that we are looking to get the most, best of both worlds. Uh, similarly, this is non-certified staff now. So what you're seeing in the red is non-certified staffing rates. In the blue, again, is our student enrollment. And again, you see this proportional relationship between the two. Again, looking to keep a good uh, proportion between students and staff at the same time, looking to achieve the most fiscally responsible outcomes we can attain. Our goal in this presentation is to have you get a glimpse on what we were thinking about as we were putting together this budget. That's why we showed you the STEM information. And this is another one of those slides just to tell you about what we were thinking about as far as the medical costs. Um, you can see the blue line is the total cost of our medical. Um, that's the blue line. And the red line is the Board of Ed's contribution. You can see in 2011, the Board of Ed paid a higher percentage of the total cost than we're anticipating in 2019-20. Um, yes, we're up 200,000, uh, 400,000 K. We're 
part of that is because of the medical re reserve that's low. We want to continue that to go up. But it's our hope that through rebidding with our, our insurance broker that we're going to save some more money, that we'll be able to get that um, reserve healthier than it is right now. Again, it's going up a little bit, but certainly not where we want it to be and not where it was when we made the deal with the town to um, you know, take some money out of it um, and, and, and help with the budget. So medical is always a wild card. We're always concerned about that. But um, we wanted to show you that we really believe that the percentage that our employees are paying is a bigger percentage. And that's thanks to you and to the um, uh, negotiations. Um, we, you know, really, we've really done a lot to kind of rein in that cost. So what are the proposed staff changes? And I, I just want to be clear on this. We have cut the education um, certified staff by 3.5 FTEs. But we've added those two coordinators. So when you look at it, it really is a net loss of 1.5 certified staff members. We did cut the 1.5 non-certified as we talked about. Um, we added the para-educators in. We put the $20,000, or the way we talk about it, is a .2 FTE for the social worker. And here's something that we've done that costs no money, but we think will help us. And that is a name change. Each school, each elementary school, ha have reading specialists. And we know reading is the most important thing, and we want our students to be able to read. And if you look at how well we score um, in in, com in compared to our DRG and in the state, we do very, very, very well in reading. We're t you're talking about top one or two in our DERG. Um, and, and that's because we spend a lot of resources doing that. What we have proposed for next year is that we're going to change the name of the reading specialists to teacher interventionists. They are still going to work on reading, there's no doubt about it. But if a student has a need in math, because we don't perform as well, we still perform pretty good in the state, actually very good in the state, but not as, mu not as high as reading. But if a student has some, needs some support in math, by changing the name, we're giving everybody a license to work with that kid in different subject areas. So that's our discussion. We have gone around and talked to the reading specialists so that we want them to know that reading is still our number one focus. We want that to be, be there. But if we find a student that needs some help and support in math, we want to be able to do that. Or in organizational skills, we want them to have the freedom to be able to do that. And um, each school has a, a team that looks at data and then decides how they're going to work with students. And we want them to have the freedom to say, just because you're a reading specialist, you know, don't feel like you always have to do reading if you want to do work in math or in other areas, you can do that. And remember, our students, when we look at the math data, it's about reading. Some of our students have issues with uh, test questions because of the reading anyway. So that's, it's a no cost to the board. Um, we're keeping the same number of people we're not adding. Um, we would love to come in and say we'd like to add a math specialist in each school, but we knew that wouldn't be fiscally responsible at this time. So we're, we're trying to do it this way. And just so you know, this is uh, K-5. K-5. This change. Yep. So back towards the beginning of the presentation, one of the things we spoke about was how to stretch dollars. So the Honeywell project has been one of the ways we've been able to stretch dollars. And what this bar chart shows you, or which this, this table shows you, is uh, what Honeywell refers to as cost avoidance. It's really savings. And this is a report for this year. We're in year three of the program. And the cost avoidance or savings for the 16-17 uh, school year is $484,295. So by implementing this program, that was costs we avoided, costs where that can be applied elsewhere uh, to programming, costs that help us to stretch energy dollars so that we're using the dollars that we have as best we can. Total savings to date through the program is $1.5 million. So we're seeing some very real savings here. The other good news in this is we have a contractual guarantee with Honeywell. That contractual guarantee for this year was for $419,000. We surpassed that guarantee by $64,000. So we were guaranteed $1.2 million. It total to date in the four years or um, three years plus implementation year, which was a partial year, we've surpassed the contractual savings by roughly a quarter of a million dollars. So this is one of the places we've really been looking to stretch dollars to do as much as we can to maximize uh, taxpayers' investment. 
So this is another one of those slides that we want to just tell you what we're trying to do to help uh, dollars. Um, Donna and I went to a workshop when we went to the CAS, um, CAPS conference um, last month. And one of the workshops was about shared services. And we're, all, we're always talking about how can we share services with area, other towns, and how can we share services with the towns that will be cost savings. So this white paper, which I have a copy of if you want, it's, it's, it was developed by the Connecticut Association of School Business Officials, Gabby's organization, in 2015. And what they did is they looked at ways in which districts in this state shared services. So the next slide shows you a list of, of areas that other districts shared services. And they can share them with other districts or they can share them with the town. So what we did is we looked at what are we in Monroe? Where do we share services in Monroe? And, and are there other places that we can look to share some services? So if you look at that, the first, uh, the first three, uh, three things are about technology. Monroe is, has, in the last several years, shared their um, computer services, their IT support with the town. So we share that with the town. And if I can just interject on that, we are truly the exception there. I, I go to a lot of meetings on technology with various towns. I, I can't tell you of another place where municipal and educational technology services are shared, and it works very, very well for us. So it's, uh, we're very fortunate to have it set up the way that we have it. And we look at three insurances, the, our liability insurance, our workers' comp, and our property insurance. And again, we hook up with the town. We share those services with the town, and that saved us money when we combine services in that area. Um, if you look down, I put in snow removal. We don't share snow removal with the town, but the town has been a wonderful partner in giving us the sand that we need, giving us a machine to help um, load our, our trucks. So they've been a good partner. They don't do the removal of our schools. We our, our people do that, but I put that there as both we are independent and we share with town because they've really been a good partner with that. And we go to meetings every year to talk about how they can help us and, 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 and we can't say enough about that. Um, we do share transportation services with other towns, especially in special education and whenever we can. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what we're doing going forward. You know, certainly our bidding and purchasing is shared with other districts. We are in consortiums. So if we want to buy colored paper, for instance, for art, we go on the site, the website, that's a consortium with other districts, and we can get it at a very reduced rate. Um, same thing with energy purchasing. Um, we share that with other districts. It's in, we're in a consortium. We get really good cost on that, and we share it with our town. The town can piggyback off of us and get that energy consortium rate that we have. Um, and then one of the things in the law that was just passed was that they want boards of education before they make a decision about manage, financial management software to consult with the town. And we've already done that five years ago with Munis. We share, the, we share that software with, with Munis, um, with the town. So we have done a lot of things. Certainly there are other things we can do. Um, as I told you in the beginning of the year, the Southwest um, superintendents, I'm sorry, the Southern Fairfield County superintendents meet. I'm part of that group. We put together a Google sheet to see where else little things, I think I, sh I shared this with you, like fire extinguisher checks and um, septic um, pumping, where we can hook up with other towns in the southern Fairfield County so we can go out to bid and say, you want five towns? Give us a better price. Um, Gabby. Gabby went with her uh, group. Um, was it Casbo? Or? No, it was the Fairfield County Business Managers. And they're looking about how to save transportation and how they can save on transportation and maybe go out to bid. And Kay Moser is working with Derg B special ed um, districts to look, about to look about saving for transportation. As in effect, part of, if you look, when we get through um, the next section of this, when we do the workshop, you'll see that Kay is saving money in transportation because she's looking at another provider um, that could save us some money for that. So we're always looking at that. We're always open to that. And um, these are other areas that maybe we could share with the town or other districts, but it's something that we wanted to just let you know about. So what are the risks to the budget? Well, state funding is a risk, no doubt about it. Those unanticipated special ed costs, someone can move in tomorrow at a, at a high cost, and, and we're obligated, and, and rightly so, to educate those students. Unfunded mandates. We just, I told you last week about the new teacher um, program, the new teacher induction called TEAM. 
where the state took away the funding for this year and said, but you still have to do the program. So it's a $10,000 hit to us that we have to cut some other part of our budget to pay for that. Who knows what's going? what other things are going to happen um, as far as unfunded mandates from the state. Um, unanticipated maintenance costs and repairs. You know, a boiler could go down. We have to take care of that. We have to deal with that. And then medical and prescription costs, as always, that's something that scares us. So we don't know about that. So what does this proposed budget do for us? We think it's fiscally responsible at 1.85. It reinstates two of the three curriculum, K-5 curriculum supports in math and science. It provides support for all students in meeting those Connecticut core standards. It provides a adequate maintenance of the building, something that you know Jim Augustine started and we're proud of. There's a lot of money in buildings, and, it's, uh, and this town should be very pleased that we're not letting any building run down, that we're always doing preventative ma maintenance, and this is something that, um, you know, this is part of what they have in town, and we're making sure that their buildings are well kept. Um, and we're, reinst we're reinstating um, some of those uh, teacher training programs that we lost this year, like those Columbia Reading and Writing Project, the Columbia University Reading and Writing Project, that we've seen some real great benefits for. We want to bring back inquiry education for that summer program, that BYOT, Bring Your Own Technology in the Summer. We're going to continue to work with those Common Core State Standards, I mean, sorry, the Connecticut Core State Standards and the Next Generation Science Standards, which, which is coming up. I mean, we're going to be tested on that in a year. Um, and so we have to be prepared, have our students be prepared so they can, so they can perform as well as the students in the next town. This is a very confusing um, slide. <coughs> We, we have it every year. We talk about it every year. I, there's just a couple things I want to point out. Um, if you look at the total cost of this year's education budget, the $55 million, what, you know, what we always talk about is the tax cost to the town is $47 million because we have these other grants. The real thing I want to point out is that the um, special ed excess cost, which is the 871 which is what actually we got this year. We did not inflate that number for next year. So that number of 968 is exactly what it would be based on traditional, um, the traditional way to figure it out. So we just want you to know that it's like this year we put 1.5 million and we, it was re reduced by 600,000. We didn't do that next year. We figured it out as we have traditionally and we've been right on the money um, traditionally, so it's 968 for that special ed excess cost. So uh, the last segment we have for you here is our five-year capital needs projection. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. I'm going to go back for uh, for one second. Um, there is uh, the pay for play is something that we've we've talked about before, and and I've had people in the community ask about that. That's the sports surcharge. So we looked at what the revenue is for the sports surcharge. And you can see it's $231,000 because this year we included the Jockey Hollow pay for play also. So if we were to say that pay for play should be eliminated, and I don't think anybody in this room would say it, that they think it's a great idea to have pay for play, but financially it's something that we've always had. I've been here for 35 years, we've always had pay for play. If we were to cut that this year, it's an extra almost half a percent to the budget. So Although I think it would be something that we would like to propose, at this point it would raise our budget by almost another half percent. So we really weren't prepared to say that. But you could see that's $231,000 that we would have to cover in our budget in order to, re to eliminate pay for play. Thanks, Jack. Sorry. No problem. So next is our capital plan. And what we have here is the uh, first section is uh, related to facilities. And the 2017-18 column here just shows you uh, what we've done. Uh, the new roof project at Stephanie Elementary was just completed, 2.6 million. And then also, what you'll see on the bottom here, is when we had gone out to the public with the turf project, one of the things that uh, we all agreed to is that we were going to fund $40,000 to the capital fund account every year for 10 years so that when we need to replace the carpet, we have the funding ready to go. So that was something we assured the community so that from a budgetary standpoint, we're not having this uh, crazy $400,000 spike 10 years from now. It's funded at a flat rate over time, making it easier for everybody. So that's in this year's budget. Going to 2018-19, we have an oil tank that needs to be replaced at Monroe Elementary School. So that's in our capital plan. 
and then again that forty thousand dollar payment for next year for the turf uh, carpet similarly is the equipment replacement plan here so 1718 re replaced two pieces of equipment as john mentioned before our intent with this is to create a relatively flat budget and not have five trucks go bad one year and have this big spike in terms of needs so we've looked to stage that out over time. The uh, truck that needs to be replaced in next year's budget is $55,000. Yeah, that's... <coughs> oh, yeah. Go ahead. Sure, Dave, you go ahead. Oh. Um, go ahead. Yeah. I thought that was under operational budget. Excuse me. Yeah, it is in the operational budget. We've put it here uh, to show where it lives over time. I was going to ask, actually ask you why it was operational versus a capital. You know, it's, it's a good question, Dave. There have been times when this has been moved to the town's capital. Uh, might be part of a dialogue at some point in time. Right now, it lives in operations, in the operations budget. But, but it'll be paid. Yeah. Correct. Jack, can you tell me where Jockey Hollow falls on the five-year capital needs a projection there is no for the, jockey hollow up there for the roof for everything i mean there's just no yes yeah. yes for roof for right given that it's the newest building it's furthest out the roof i can get you that information i, want I wasn't to even looking at the roof like under Mon monroe you have replaced cafeteria floor under yeah. central law but right. there's nothing for jockey hollow on there. Well, all of those buildings are much older so those floors and those things need to be replaced but at this point there's no, we don't have a big capital project that we can't put in our operating budget gotcha. to, for Jockey Out. Mm -hmm. I mean, that might come up, Jerry, in the next two, one, two, three years, but right now um, there's not anything in it. And then the other piece that we've really been taking bait, great pains to ensure is maintaining the roofs that we have to prolong their life. So we spent a good amount of, of money on the repairing roof sections at uh, Jockey Out, things like expansion joints in an effort to maximize the amount of time that we get out of that roof too. So again, we keep the end in mind as we did this budget. I think through our slides, you saw a glimpse in what we were thinking of as we were putting this budget together. You know, we were thinking about bringing, uh, when we can bring STEM back. We were thinking about the, the state funds and the state grants as we were building this budget. So we hope that this executive summary kind of gives you a glimpse of what we were thinking of as we were putting this budget together. So certainly, Jack and I can answer any questions about this executive summary. We are going to move right into um, the next budget workshop for tonight, which is HR, staffing, curriculum, IT, and operations. But we'll take any questions that you have just about this general overview that we did, or unless you just want to wait until it comes up in our section. OK, so we're going to start with um, the, all these cost centers, HR, staffing, curriculum, PD, IT, facilities, and capital planning. And Gabby's going to come up, and Sheila's going to come up, and, um, and we're going to talk about that. Now, remember, next week on December 11th, we start our meeting at 630, and that's going to be special education and athletics, and we're going to talk about that next week. And then finally, on the 18th, we're going to do a wrap-up, and any questions that you have on that, we'll go with. So we're going to go, before we start... I just want to give you a quick overview of this budget book. So if you look at the first section of the budget book, section number one, those are our Board of Ed goals and action plans. And those are the goals and action plans that you put together, the board put together five years ago. Now, as you go through this, you'll see that we've met many of those goals. So we talked about that in September as we presented this to you, and we are going to have a, um, a special meeting to come up with new goals and action plans at uh, in the springtime this year with the, with this board. Um, but I just we wanted to give you our goals and action plans and the work that we've done to meet those needs. The second is the executive summary that I just, um, just shared, that Jack and I just shared with you. And then the next sections are budgets by category. So when we're going to talk about curriculum today, you're going to be able to look at section three. When we talk about human resources or staffing, that's section four, and we're going we're to refer you to those sections. Um, facilities is section five. The, um, then there's a total budget overview of all the sections in the budget on six. There's a staffing summary. So when we talked about where we're losing staff and where we're gaining staff, you could go to section seven and see exactly by school where certified staff lives, where um, non-certified staff lives and, and, and the changes that have happened. 
Section 9 will be special ed that we'll talk about along with Section 10 athletics next week. And then if you look at section, oh, I'm sorry, section eight is the enrollment summary. Now in the past, we have included the um, Malone and McBroom demographic study. But I remember talking to you last month saying, do we want to do an update? And no one really felt that the update was necessary because it was kind of, it was off a lot. Again, it was off 136 students just for this year. So what we've included is the actual enrollments um, from October 1 and some of the projections that we had. So that's what you see in that section. We didn't include the whole Malone and McBroom demographic study in that. Um, so uh, that's 9 and 10 is athletics and special ed. 11 is the revenue that I talked to you about. Then the capital expenses there. So that's how the budget is set up. It is on our website. So anybody that's watching from home would like to go through any of these sections or look at any of these sections. Those, um, those things are there. It's on the website. Uh, as we have changes or any areas that we want to focus on or that we found mistakes, we'll update that on our website and give you guys copies of that too. Okay? So we're going to start with human resources, and Jack's going to start with that and point you to a section. So uh, what we put together is just a very concise overview to highlight key budget lines that have significant changes. Um, at any point, feel free to stop us if you have questions in areas that we're not covering in this overview. So um, just to harken back to the presentation John just gave a moment ago, this is that, that uh, big slice of the pie. Um, we, are, we are a staff-based entity. We are a service industry. Uh, we are a people business. So the majority of this budget lives within salaries and benefits. And in this pie chart that John had just shared, 80.41% uh, or uh, 80 cents of every dollar is uh, used for salaries uh, and benefits of the people that serve students in the district. And um, again, the, the ups and downs with all of our staff here. Um, John just reviewed this with you. This, this, these are all of the changes related to our staffing um, in the district this year. The only other thing I'd like to just add with this change to the teacher interventionist is that it's really gonna allow um, our folks to respond to needs. It's gonna create a lot of uh, flexibility in being able to respond to whatever needs our students will have uh, within the elementary level. Another change within the budget, and this is in your tab four, this is a specific one. On uh, tab four, you'll find this line 751129, and you'll see that this is one of the larger swings uh, in budgetarily. And this line is uh, AIDS, regular education, this refers to our paraeducators. And that's an increase of $179,000. And what comprises that increase is uh, that contract was just negotiated this past uh, summer, spring summer. So um, general wage increases was 2.45 percent of that increase, uh, $97,000 in total. And then the other piece that's within this increase is moved to a single grade system. In the past, what we've had for our paraeducators is there were two grades. One grade would work, would work with special education students. Another grade would not work with special education students. They would work with regular ed. The problem with that setup was that there are times, lots of times, when duties change during the course of the day. You couldn't use somebody in both places because you would get into a situation where the grade would need to be changed. It's really, it was very inefficient and not effective. Similar to what I highlighted just a moment ago with the teacher interventionist, the nice thing about changing that title is we can respond to student needs whatever they are. It's not locked into reading only. We have a math need, it's a math need. We respond to it. Similarly, if we have a need within regular education, we respond to it. If we have a need in special education, we respond to it. The grades don't inhibit that work with students. So this was a good change that the board was able to make within negotiations. And we believe that the principals will have the flexibility and they'll save on substitutes because we'll be able to move people around more easily. Um, if you're a paraeducator in this district, you're a paraeducator in this district and you can work anywhere. Um, certainly we're going to take in mind um, some of the training, but we're gonna, it, it's going to allow us a lot more flexibility. And some of the strategies we're using for containing benefits. Uh, again, going back to the pie there, it's the place where we can have the biggest impact on costs. 
So one of the things we implemented brand new this year was a wellness program. You had the chance to hear about that at the last board meeting. As you heard Cigna say, uh, I believe what she had stated, we were the largest number of participants with of their districts involved in a wellness program. Um, that's 190 staff that we have walking, and it was interesting. Um, I was in buildings throughout the day today. There's a lot of people walking through our buildings, uh, logging steps as part of this wellness program. So uh, it's clearly having an impact on our folks, ultimately leading to more healthy staff, which is going to contribute to better insurance rates over time. can only help us. Uh, the other thing that we've had is uh, staff reimbursement for 37 road races to date. This is coming through Cigna Wellness dollars, another way of promoting our folks and getting out and getting fit. And then we just had a conference call this morning on the biometric screenings that were shared in the last Board of Ed meeting, and we're putting that work together. We're hoping for February or Mar March to have screenings in the buildings that uh, are proactive in helping all of us staff identify small medical issues before they become big, expensive medical issues. So first and foremost, making our staff healthy and happy. And then a major byproduct is saving money for all of us, the Board of Education and staff as well, because they're contributing to those co-pays. So really a lot of potential positives in this work. And then the other piece here highlighted in the Cigna presentation last week, the Teladoc 24-7 uh, doctor support via the phone, cheaper for employees, cheaper for us, in that if we're avoiding those, em uh, those emergency room visits, which are very costly, and using phone support to deal with smaller issues, it's a win-win for everybody. And then as John mentioned before, Brown and Brown has been very good and they continue to work on things like looking at how we can renegotiate our contracts to get better savings in uh, our current insurance plans. And also another uh, aspect that need, that's definitely worthy of highlighting, the board did a really good job in all of the negotiations uh, recently and all of the post-retirement benefits have been negotiated out of all of our contracts at this point in time. So that too will have an impact on these savings over time. And then lastly, current pension trends for our non-certified staff have been very favorable. What that means to us is because those investments are strong and they're showing really good returns, that continues to diminish likelihood that we would need to make any contribution towards that to keep those uh, investments solvent. So that also will help us in saving costs. Jack, to help my phone not ring off the hook, could you explain a little bit more the reduction of post-retirement benefits? Uh, that refers to the sunsetting of benefits for individuals who haven't retired yet already in the system. Uh, things in contracts like if you were hired after 1995, you're not entitled to that benefit. So that's what the, re the uh, sunset refers to, not current retirees. <laughs> Next up, we have Sheila Castanelli to talk to you about curriculum and professional development. I, I did yeah, have Jerry. one question, Jack, for you. Yeah. On uh, human resource, line item uh, 751250. Just explain it real quick. Reinstatement of clubs? Yeah, uh, we cut some clubs um, based on the million dollar cut last year, so we're bringing those clubs back. Um, and one of the things that we noticed is if you look at what we actually spent in 2017 um, and what we budgeted, um, we're, we're doing some true ups basically. I have to tell you, what we did this year is we went through line by line by line by line and, and we looked at some things and some things weren't in the, we felt weren't in the right place so we made some changes. So when you see some of the things that say true ups, um, it's because we took it from one spot and put it into another, or in this case, we never budgeted enough, and we were always trying to do catch up. So we, we budgeted what actually will happen next year. Thank you. Yes, part of the statement is also the, um, the full reinstatement of the band. And yes. For the elementary. Yes, those are morning stipends um, that they're going to look at this that's year. That's in there too. That's in there too, yes. Any other questions on that? So if you look at tab four, those are the things, those are the budget items for human resources. <clears throat> and, um, you know, we looked at some, some things that we, we thought, oh, you know, we wanted to share with you. So that was the paraprofessionals. But if there's other things in that, um, in that line item or that section that you want us to talk about, we certainly can do that as we go down the list. 
Um, you know, you, you'll notice in negotiation reserve on the on four two, we reduce that by almost two hundred thousand because remember we've had four we we've had four or five contracts that we needed to negotiate. We didn't need to have that. So, um, and again, what we put in the negotiation reserve is we anticipate what a percentage may be. So that's in the negotiated reserve to cover uh, the budget. So can you just what contracts are left? The end of this year, we're going to have to negotiate for the nurse, and then we don't have anything for two years, right? That's two what years. I, I right. wanted the teachers to clarify. Teachers, teachers, teachers in two years. Teachers in two years. Thank you. Yeah, George. You get a line for regular ed, <coughs> and then a line for special ed. Those aren't two different contracts, correct? They are not two different All contracts. Different lines. No. Can the state likes us to the when we have to do the EDO one for the state, we have to take out special ed costs and regular ed costs. Clarify the difference in percentage increase. Then, well, why that? Why that's different yeah. between the two? It, it's really people. We so we put the actual people in there. So you know, teachers can go up a step, yeah. move over a lane, um, and so it's not just a straight percentage increase. Because if I just got my master's, I go from the bachelor's to the master step. Also, um, we have more regular ed teachers retiring this year. So the thought is, is that we would replace a teacher who's, say, at the top of their step um, with a lower step teacher. And so that's another reason why the increase is much less. OK, so we can move on to curriculum impression at the moment. We can always come back to anything that you have. So the big changes that you'll see in curriculum and instruction is actually reinstating things that I had put into the budget for this year before we had that million dollar cut to Monroe. So the $21,000 that was cut for Teachers College is being put back and what that means, what I had planned on doing for this current school year and budgeted for prior to the cut was having our three elementary schools each having a staff developer for K through two and a separate one for three through five because that's the way teachers college typically splits their professional development and I wanted each building to have their own for both K to two and three through five so that way I didn't have to have teachers traveling between schools and then we're dealing with delays of trying to get people there and if we can have it in the building, it's just smoother for scheduling all the way around. Um, so with the cuts for this year, we had to modify that, and we are currently doing just grades two through four, which Teachers College doesn't typically do, but they very nicely did because we've got a great relationship with them, and we've been working with them for the last several years. This is our fifth year, actually. And the staff developers love to come to Monroe. They love working with our students and love working with our teachers because they see the growth that we see in our students every day. And just so you know, this is section three, if the things that uh, she was referring to. Uh, additionally, in that 21,000, in adding back the time, is also um, allowing us to go back into New York City. Teachers College does these things they call calendar days. They're one-day workshops specific to a grade level or a grade range and then it'll have a focus to it. It might be the reading unit of study or the writing unit of study, so it'd be more information on what the teachers are actually teaching. Our teachers love to go to these, and I get them, and they, as soon as I send out the email with the list of all the options, my inbox gets hit with all these requests. I'd like to go to this and this, a first choice, a second choice, and a third choice. And the teachers love it, and they're missing it, not having it this year. So that would be part of that 21,000 that we'd be reinstating. Um, with the curriculum writing, there's a lot of things that go into this 30,000. Um, our next generation science standards, we've had presentations from Roseanne and from Jim on how those standards have really changed. So it changes instruction, it changes the curriculum. They, Roseanne and Jim have been trying to do it through after school meetings, through our professional development days, but they really need a bulk of time. And teachers don't want to leave their classrooms because they want to be with their students. So trying to find other times to do this has been tricky. And then having the cut of $30,000 has really put everything on hold. They can get a little bit done through those weekly or monthly meetings, but not nearly the bulk of what we need to. So in reinstating that would be great, especially for the next generation science standards. As John mentioned, this year we're doing a pilot. Um, and then next year the real new test is out. So we really want to make sure that our students have the curriculum and materials in their hands so that they're prepared for when they take that. 
We also, Connecticut adopted the national standards for the arts, for art and for music. We've started doing a very minor change, again, with our curriculum writing because of that $30,000 cut. We couldn't do a big jump on that last summer. So putting that back in would be very, very helpful. The interim assessments for Smarter Balanced, our teachers are using with students in grades three through eight several times during the course of the year. But taking a look at those questions and the way in which they are asked, students are given a question and asked to pick the possible, all the correct answers. So there may be three out of the four answers that are correct. If they only pick two, they get the answer wrong. So it's working through putting those kinds of questions in the hands of students so that they can see what they look like so they're more comfortable with them. So we would want more time for that. We're also doing curriculum reviews. If we haven't looked at a curriculum for several years, we want to bring it back and take a look at it and see what are the updates that we can put in there. So curriculum reviews are part of our curriculum writing. And then as the secondary instructional leaders bring new courses that are being offered, we need to offer curriculum writing time in the summer so that that course is ready to go before the beginning of the new school year. The $25,000 for summer prof professional development, as John mentioned, a couple of the different things that we've offered in the past and we weren't able to offer this past summer. Uh, the next generation science standards, there's actually training specific to that for, at the different grade levels for K through five and then six through 12 that we would love to have some of our teachers take part in that's offered only during the summer. The um, art standards, those national standards that Connecticut adopted, also has training in the summer for teachers for art and for music. We've got the BYOT, we've got the Inquiry, we've got the Google Institutes, all things that were very well received and that our teachers took part in and really helped them to grow professionally during the summer so that way they would be prepared for students during the course of the year are things that we've missed from this past year. So the big bulk and the changes that you'll see in my budget and the lines that I kind of touch in here are really bringing back the things that have been proposed but were unfortunately cut. We shared this booklet with you earlier in the year which had all of our scores which is also on our website. This is just a couple of the highlights. Just to reiterate the importance of curriculum development and professional development with our teachers and for students is that with all of that work, our students grow. Our teachers grow professionally and are able to present information to students in a better way. Our language arts scores, as we shared with you, are so strong. And I really feel it is due to the work that we've done with Teachers College and the way they get our students and our teachers to think about things and to grow and to stretch has been amazing. The, those staff developers really empower our teachers to challenge our students. Our former ELA, K-5 ELA coordinator, Deborah Walls, is the person who really pushed to get Teachers College here. And it was one of her proudest moments for the fact that we had that and the growth that we would see when we walked into classrooms. Um, with her retirement and the cuts, I am actually taking on her role of K-5 ELA coordinator and working very closely with the reading consultants that are at all three elementary schools to help really move this work forward. As you also know, our math scores aren't exactly where we'd like them to be. Um, and with our K-5 coordinator, Cindy Brooker, back in the classroom this year due to those budget cuts, I'm trying to take on some of the math support with Cindy to help our teachers take a look at those interim assessments that we're giving for Smarter Balance to see where some of the questions are that we can help students. Um, those interim assessments are really give us a lot of information to help the teachers to take a look at those questions. Like I said, it'll be give the three answers that are correct in a choice of four. There's a lot of vocabulary in those questions, which makes it really tricky, which leads to that reading specialist being called the teacher interventionist, which is such a perfect thing for us to be doing this year, especially in light of our math scores. Our reading specialists no reading and our reading scores reflect that. They have done an amazing job working with our neediest of students to really move them along to not need as much support as they get into those older grades. But we do need that help with math and so many of these math things have so much language in them and the language is very tricky. What's the greatest uh, answer? What's the least answer? 
it's a word problem that has multiple steps to it that students are being asked to do. So there's a lot of language that has to be dissected in math. So having these teacher interventionists support our students will be a wonderful thing. Alan? Yeah, I get what you're doing in the elementary school, but what are you doing in the middle school with regards to math? We actually have math interventionists in oh, the middle do? school. Okay. Um, already, there were they're already not certified. Right, they're para positions. They're, yeah, they're they're not certified. They're not Correct. paras. They're mm -hmm. non-certified. Classified. Classified. And we've never. I've been in this district for 12 years, and when I first started, and Deborah, Deb Kavachi, and Sue Austin, and I used to sit as three elementary principals to plan our budget. <clears> one of the things that we would always go to, when my first year went to Alan Beitman, the previous superintendent was asking for a math interventionist, a math teacher to support, like we had the reading consultant. And every year, it was not fiscally responsible for us to be adding staff at that time. So this is a way for us to be able to support our neediest students to get that, that extra support in math with a certified teacher. Um, as we went around and talked to all of them, they were concerned on the math language and did they know them. So Cindy Brooker is going to work with me and the reading specialists through professional development, through our April PD day, and then some other time that we can in after school meetings to get them up to speed with where things are. And they'll work very closely with the classroom teachers that they already work with now by supporting the students in reading. They'll now also do that for, to support them with math. And we'll also see what happens with how, how well this works K-5. We do have reading people, not as many at the middle school, but we might be able to do the interventionists at the middle school too to see if, if, if it works for us K-5, we can move it up. In general, what type of math concepts are they learning in the middle school? And in the, how is a reading specialist going to help them? Well, the again, school? it comes back to, I spent the day with Kevin at a math workshop today, and again, it comes back to the language. You know, it's the, the same idea of understanding and dissecting a word problem to say, what is it really and truly asking you to do? And that's where a reading background can be able to give the direction to the student. And if I can just add one more, th I'm sorry, Donna, did you want to say something? Go ahead. Um, okay. Um, really, if you go back to those scores for a minute for me, Jack, um, really all of those scores could not happen without our curriculum work, without our professional development, and without all the people who are sitting behind me and those K-5 coordinators and the work that they do with teachers to help support students every single day. With regard to um, professional development, <clears throat> what is the state mandate? Because we have to provide spe uh, professional development to our certified staff right. per mandate, mandate. by the state Fif of Connecticut. Yes. 15, 15 hours, hours a year. 15 hours we have to provide 15 hours a year. And that's what our PD days do. Yes. Um, but some of this other stuff, the summer institutes, the summer professional development, it gives you um, a, a longer period of time where you can work with groups. The coordinators that you want to put back into the budget, do you think that those positions have anything to do with the Blue Ribbon School Award and School of Distinction and, and different awards that Monroe School has got? I mean, I think it? it's all just part of the yeah, team. When you look at our, our, our curriculum team, uh, the reason why our students perform so well is because we're, we look at, um, we look at the, the standards, we look at how well our programs are meeting the standards. You know, we put in a new math textbook a few years ago. But what happened is that K-5 coordinator last year started to look at, what are we missing? It's just, this is a book. We're, it's not the curriculum, it's a book, so she started to look at how we have to supplement. And so she would meet with teachers weekly and say, okay, this standard is not being met, we have to supplement it by using this. Mm -hmm. And then she provided that. So I think when you look at this district and you look at the K-12 curriculum leadership, from the K-5 coordinators to the 612 secondary instructional leaders to Sheila and Jack, there's continuity there. And we're making sure that everybody's on the same page. It's not, you know, when I first started, you got, you, you know, you got a book, you shut the door, and you did what you wanted. Um, but that didn't really help students because I was doing something different than the person next to me. Now we're really coordinating our efforts to make sure that we're doing the best that we can. And it's paying off. So, yes, I think it has all to do with that. Right. I think, like, when the state cuts our budget and, and the fifth grade band was at risk, that's crystal clear to, to the parents right. and stuff how that's going to affect us. And I think that this is so important 
the, these coordinators and these positions are so important to such a huge aspect the, in the elementary level, you know, getting a good grasp of it then will, will lead you on a good trajectory for middle school, for high school, and so forth. And it's such a big part of the program, and I'm not sure that um, it, it might be more behind the scenes. I'm not sure that people would be aware of the importance of this and why I, we need it. I agree with you 100%. That's why anytime I talk to any group of people, I talk about those coordinators and how it's going to make a difference as we go down. I talk about professional development being um, research and development. Um, and people get that. People in the business world understand that. Mm -hmm. And when I sit at a, um, a parents' council or some of the nights and Jack and I went and we talked about that, people were shaking their head. They understand that the way their company grows and moves mm -hmm. is that they don't just stay stale. Um, how many times have I heard, well, they're, they were educated to be a teacher. Why, why do they need professional development? We can't stay the same way we've always, kids change, curriculum changes, ideas change, and we want to stay up with those. I was, I was a mom in this district for a long time before I was a Board of Ed member, and I think as a mom, I don't think I would have understood the importance of that Absolutely. like I do now. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think it's difficult. They don't see it. They don't see the behind the scenes, the midday meetings, the after school meetings every Tuesday. People don't see that. Mm -hmm. um, but like you said, if you cut you know, a sports yeah, program or a band, they would see that they because see it that affects so them. Easier. You have an yeah. award winning school district and people want to move here, right. it increases your house value. I mean, it's just right. it's not that that's why you're doing it, you're doing it for the kids, but it's just a big part of the bigger picture. Yes, great. thank you. George, did you have another question too? The reading specialists, uh, are they on board with providing additional direction in the other subject areas? Yes. And some of them are doing it at times already. They've done it um, when they take a look at some of the SBAC questions last year when the interims came out and they saw the big need for all of this vocabulary. They were pulling small groups during wind time to kind of take a look at that. So they've already done a little bit of it. They're also excited to see what something else looks like. And they'll do it for short periods of time based on needs of students. The interesting thing, too, is, you know, there was some anxiety with it. Um, the math has become much harder, you know, so one of the anxiety pieces was teaching fifth grade math now. So it's a transition, as Sheila mentioned, the professional development is a really important part of it. We're not going to, we're going to ensure their success through giving them the training they need to be successful with kids. And Jack, Sheila, and I and the principals went to each school last week and to talk to the reading people because we I didn't want we were going to present this to you and I didn't want them to hear it here and I want we wanted to get the feedback from them and overwhelmingly it was positive. Mm -hmm. John, didn't you even bring the MEA on this? Actually, course? that's yeah. true. We that's um, right. we we mm -hmm. talked with the MEA first, uh, MEA leadership, and they actually um, thanks you they actually came with us. Marie Blake came with us oh, when we talked incredible. to the teachers mm -hmm. because. Again, we're all on the same page. What are we doing it for? We're not, you know, what's the bottom line is for so our students can be better served. And the leadership of the MEA agreed, and they came with us when we presented it. Thanks, Jerry. I forgot to say that. Can we go back to the K-5 coordinators again? Um, to me, I think we have a very big risk not having especially a K-5 science coordinator with our next generation science standards coming out. I mean, I think that'll be a huge issue trying to roll out these Absolutely. new standards. And again, these are not our standards. This is the state of Connecticut standards that say you need to implement this. Um, so that's a huge risk if we don't have a K-5 coordinator for science because I sat on the K-5 team for math and focus when we implemented math and focus. I don't think math and focus would have been implemented as successfully as it, that Absolutely. it was mm -hmm. if we did not have Cindy Brooker as our math coordinator to, to implement that. It was a huge undertaking. Absolutely. What is the risk? And this, because this could be a very serious problem, not only just K to five, but this is K to 12 because our science is being tested in five, eight, and what is it now? It's going to be 11. 11. 11. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be an 11. So it's really from kindergarten straight oh, through, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, 11th grade. So if this does not get rolled out properly, as our other programs were, like Common Core for math and, and um, English language, that's going to be a huge problem in the district because we're going to have parents and kids um, you know, just not being understanding, and, and we're going to see a very significant reduction next year to science if we do not 
replace right. these cord banners. And, and you know, our districts, uh, our other districts are preparing their kids for that with those kinds of positions and some more. Um, so we will be at a disadvantage. Yeah, we, we agree. That's why we worked hard. Again, we think 1.85 is pretty fiscally responsible, but we worked hard to make sure that those coordinators were in there. And, you know, we looked at, okay, is you putting all three back? What does that do? Um, and, and so as a team, we worked together and said, okay, we have somebody with some expertise in that area. Maybe down the road, we might want to bring that coordinator back. But that's why we thought at least two of the three we need. Right. And I don't think the general public understands what, yeah. as Shannon said, they don't, it's a beside, behind the scenes thing. They don't realize what a huge undertaking rolling out a brand new science standard you know, for the entire district, or in this case, well, just not us, but the whole state, mm -hmm. is the mm -hmm. undertaking of rolling that out and rolling that out successfully. It's not a simple, here's the new sta standards, go with it. Just teach it. Yeah. Teach when it. That, when does that go live, the new science standards? They, I'm sorry. Uh, they are live. They are live now. Yes, yeah. the state already adopted them, so we have been in the process of adjusting curriculum as best as Roseanne can on the elementary level through those afternoon meetings and through the midday meetings. Um, we're we're so behind. We're we, behind on, on implementing these standards. We are fortunate that Roseanne is um, on two different state committees. Um, she's on, excuse me, she's on one state committee and then Jim Stolzel, who's our 612 secondary instructional leader for science, is also on a state committee. So they are kind of, Roseanne's rolling up her sleeves and actually writing the test question. She's on that committee and Jim is on the more curriculum end of committee. So we're getting the latest information, but as John said, we're a little bit behind because we don't have them working on it full time. Any other questions for curriculum? Yeah, on PD, the, I'm looking at the first line on the, the, on the budget. There's an increase there because of changing needs. Can you just describe what that is? Are you talking about the professional educational services? Actually, that's um, not professional development that's um, outside um, costs for for special ed so the special ed numbers have gone down but the cost to educate kids using like IPP and those programs have gone up so that's why there's an increase of 84,000 yeah it, you know it's 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 under curriculum and instruction but it is a special ed part that Kay will talk about um, when she comes up but pardon? So it is. Uh, it's a little confusing. At some of this, some of these lines are special ed and curriculum instruction. Some of them are athletics and curriculum. So it's it's a little. Different. Any other questions on professional development or curriculum? All right. The next section is on technology, and this is in tab five. And in that tab, the first line we're going to look at is seven five six five one one. This one is software renewals. That's a reduction of 6.13%, a decrease of $12,934. Uh, the reason for that is um, some greater use of free applications. Then the other thing that's going on too is uh, we're making a change with our web hosting, and I'll show a little more about that in the next slide. Um, another line in this uh, tab five is 757340. This one's technology related hardware. And this one's an increase of 140%. Uh, the reason for that increase is $69,000 is uh, in the last few years, Gabby, what would you say, last three, three or four was in the lease line? Yes. Um, um, pro actually, probably since 2013, so four years. So about four years. Most of our technology replacement hardware funds have lived in the lease line. It really wasn't the right place for those funds to live. It's for leases. So rather than do that, we trued things up. We're putting the, those funds into the technology-related hardware. That increase is 100% for replacing our aging Chromebooks. Uh, we have Chromebooks. We were one of the first adopters of Chromebooks, and they're old. And they're at the point where they're going to go end of life quite soon, so we really need to get serious about replacing a lot of them uh, so that we have sufficient working devices in our classrooms. So related to the um, website, um, just to let you know what's going on with that and where we're also realizing some savings, but I wanted to keep you in the loop about what will change. Our current website, the support ends for it December 2018, a year from now. 
Uh, we will start working in February to create a parallel site. You won't use the same address as our current one. We'll have a different uh, URL for it. We will point people, the community members, parents, Board of Ed, to the new site, give people a chance to look at the new site, give us feedback on the new site before it goes live July 2018. So we make sure both are up and running in good condition, everybody's happy with what we're putting there, or most everybody's happy with what we're putting there. And then we put it up uh, July 1 and ev give everybody the summer to uh, acclimate to the new site. Now with that, um, we were very fortunate. School Messenger, the company that um, uh, uh, creates our announcements for snow days, that whole process. They also provide websites, and because we're already a customer, we were able to save money by bundling everything together. Actually, the John's slide on consortiums, they're on the state bid list, so we're able to bunch it together with a lot of other districts. So we're seeing some savings there, too, within that software line. And then um, also in the uh, technology budget, just to remind everybody, because this was important savings for us that was done uh, three years ago, we um, we renegotiated our copier contract at 757310. And uh, the, this current year, you'll see an increase of 6.18% or $8,000. The reason why there's an increase this year is we needed to add a copier at high school special ed. Uh, IEPs are among the most sensitive documents that we have. We don't want them being printed out in other locations. So we tried to do that with local printers, but it wasn't working well. So we needed to put a copy machine there. So in future years, we saved our, our projected savings for the copier contract was $640,000 over five years. I brought that back to 630. But when we renegotiated this contract, that, that's the real savings that we're looking at over the five year duration. So that was a real success for us in, um, in saving some funds over time. And then the other success within the copier contract is in the two previous fiscal years, we saved $50,000 in paper because of the way these machines work. And just to refresh memories on this, we've had this in the last couple um, budget presentations a few pre the two previous years. The way we're, we're saving that money is, uh, forgive me, these, these numbers are a little small, but the bar chart shows you what's going on. The machines delete uh, manually um, or automatically. Uh, they refer to it, it as maintenance. So the delete maintenance means if I print something to the copy machine and I don't, um, I have to, all of us, when we go up to the copy machine, we have to use our security badge. We swipe in, oh, it knows it's Jack Zamry. My print jobs are all there. If I don't print out that job in 24 hours, it gets deleted, it goes away. A lot of people make mistakes with printing jobs. And you, in the old days, our old copy machines, we'd have two or three jobs print out for the same one thing. Well, this manual you can see here, we've saved um, on average, this is a monthly report, about 800 bucks by that feature. The other thing that happens is I go up to the copy machine, I see, oh, I've got five print jobs. Oh, I printed that one four times. I click the delete button four times, and I only need one of those. So I manually delete out. Well, the savings, this is our actual report for the month of, of November for the town of BOE. Through those two processes, we saved $1,442. So this is another one of those stretching mechanisms we use with our budgetary dollars to maximize uh, taxpayers' revenues as best we can. And another uh, instance where we teamed up with the town um, for this photocopy. So we worked together on that to get a good price for both the town and the Board of right. It's one contract for both <clears throat> sides. Next we have Gabby de Blasi. So just very quickly, this is really talking about your infrastructure, so that's the, the nuts and bolts and what goes on behind the, behind the classroom walls, or in the classroom walls, I guess. Um, water, we have a slight increase of about $3,000. It's really because we <coughs> took back the field at Chalk Hill, um, and we have, we're going ir to we irrigate that field for soccer. Um, and we looked at what the cost was for the fall, and we said, okay, we need to bump that up a little tiny bit. So it's a, a small increase of about $3,000. We've also increased contracted services. We have a backlog of maintenance um, to do because of the budget cuts from the state, the million dollars. Um, so these are basically quoted repairs on our HVAC system and our boiler repairs. Um, so we're going to try to work through those next year. Um, the last thing we want is for our heating system or cooling systems go down in the buildings and have both students and staff uncomfortable. Um, cold, actually. We really don't want children to be in the buildings when it's cold. That's not a great idea. It's not really great for learning. 
Um, transportation, we have a slight decrease of about $78,000. Um, it's really because of the way that we're getting our special ed buses allocated. Um, as you saw, there's some students coming back in the district, so we don't have to transport them. So that's actually a little bit of a savings for us. Um, electricity, it's a 6.93% increase, and that's primarily related to an increase requested by Eversource from the DUPC for um, a delivery charge increase. They're asking for a 6.79% increase on delivery charges. Um, that is on residential customers. So we are considered, believe it or not, a residential customer as a school system. Um, so if Eversource gets that, you too will see that at home, unfortunately. Um, equipment non-instructional, this is the truck. Um, we have a 2009 GMC Chevy GMC liftgate truck. It's one of our plow trucks. While a 2009 doesn't seem that old, the mileage that that truck logs, a lot of it is in reverse as well as in forward. Um, and it's pushing snow. It has a sander on it. Um, it gets corroded. It's really, you know, plowing, plowing school parking lots is not really great for trucks, even if we try to wash them and clean them off. Um, after we salt and sand the parking lots and plow. They just, they, they get, they take a beating. They really, really do. And lastly, we have a decrease, um, and John mentioned this in the executive summary of the bond principle. Um, again, this is because as of this year, we find, we fully repaid a $100,000 interest-free loan to Eversource for Pure. That was part of the Honeywell contract. Um, so our bond payments, bond principle payments back to the town for the tax-exempt lease goes down to $301,000, and um, so that's where that's coming from. And this is just very quickly, um, this was already briefly touched on in the executive summary, but it's our capital plan. Again, we completed the new roof at Stepney. Um, the oil tank replacement at Monroe Well, the board has a little bit of a decision to make here because um, we could pull the oil tank and replace it for $117,000, or we could just remove it and the removal would only cost about twelve and a half thousand dollars. The 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 key there is that Monroe L was converted to natural gas in January. No, sorry, January of two thousand and twelve, and we have not used oil in that building since then. Um, oil is actually a lot dirtier. Um, there's a lot more maintenance to be done when you have um, oil burning boilers. So gas is a cleaner way to go. But again, that that's a board decision. Um, and uh, just so that the board, uh, we'll talk about this in the springtime, if we decide to not replace the oil tank and just get rid of it, it would be so cost prohibitive to put another oil tank. We wouldn't be able to put it underground anymore. We'd have to, you know, so if in years to come we thought oil was the way to go, it would be a lot more money to put oil back. But that's something that we're going to present to you in uh, the springtime and you can make a decision on that. Um, and then looking out in the future, Fawn Hollow driveway drainage and reconfiguration, um, we have some plans on that. It's really because Fawn Hollow doesn't have a great slope, and in the winter, we get some icy spots, and no matter how well the guys go out and try to sand and salt it, it just, you know, you have icy spots, and they're just dangerous. Um, Massac High School, there here too, there's an oil tank replacement. Here we would actually pull the tank and replace it. Um, this, the building here has done has burned both oil and gas in the course of a single year, depending upon winter f rate fluctuations and things like that. So here we sort of, we can play the hedge and we play the float a little bit more there. Um, Long-term replacing of the, fl of the flooring in the all-purpose slash cafeteria at Monroe Well, it's just old and it's lifting in certain places. Um, we can repair it in-house in little pieces, but a full-on replacement. And that number is really a placeholder. Um, it's a real approximation. Same thing with roof repair um, and replacement at Monroe Well. Uh, the 20-year warranty expires in 21-22. Um, you know, if it's if Stephanie's any indicator, we're probably looking in the two million. But you know, that's that's a long way off still. And finally, we would eventually maybe be looking at replacing and actually installing a, a true HVAC system at. Um, central office. Uh, the return there is a plenum system, which basically means it's an open attic space, and there's no true duct work up in the attic there. So it's kind of interesting. And finally, equipment replacement. Again, the John referred, or sorry, Jack referred to this uh, during the overview, the executive summary. We've done the Cushman, and we did the floor rider machine. We're looking to do the truck next year. 
um, looking out ahead. We're looking to do a f another walk behind floor machine. We're looking to replace a 350 truck and even further out another Cushman. Um, you know, the equipment gets old and it's used. I mean, you can see it's a 1984 Cushman. I don't know too many people who have anything from 1984 left at this point. Um, we, we do a good job up here with um, duct tape and, and other modes of repairing and replacing. So, you know, the guys do really a nice job, but 1984 is a little old. So that's kind of where we're at. So th this is our, we, we <clears throat> did the highlights of the different sections that we talked about today. The same thing that we'll do with athletics and special ed. Um, I know it was a lot to digest. It was a lot of information. It was a lot of numbers. Um, but certainly we can start the next meeting with questions. Um, if you have questions and you want to email them in advance, we can make sure that we get that information to you also. But we can start the next meeting with questions. Um, so any questions on anything that we provided today? <clears throat> so again, the <laughs> so, um, we, you know, we did provide you a lot of information. I know we, th we threw that out I, uh, and we highlighted what we thought would be the questions that you would ask. Again, there's not a lot in that, but this budget, it's, a, it's mostly um, staffing um, as far as uh, salaries and benefits. So the other parts, we just wanted to share with you any little things that we have. So. Okay. So our next budget workshop, will, which will be just a true budget workshop, we will not combine it with um, our board regular board meeting, will be um, next Monday night starting at 6.30 here. And so we can, even though that night we'll be doing athletics and special ed, if there's any questions with regard to what's been covered, we will go over that also that night too. Um, and stuff so we will do that we will move on to old business which there's none so we will move on to new business and we have a first review of policy 5141.3 which is students health assessments George do you want to discuss that yeah Jack I'm gonna need your, your help a little bit with this but basically sure. we combined our existing policy with some new language from Cape correct right. yeah it was the core policy from CABE, we retained a little bit of our current language, reviewed by the nursing supervisor in K. Moser. Right. And that's just language that's specific to the Monroe school system and our requirements for kids coming into the district. Correct. And is this something that changed because of state, the state, or is this just an update we did ourselves? Primarily recommendations from CABE. Okay. All right, does anybody have any questions regarding this? All right, this will be up for then a second review next time. Uh, and that's it for tonight. Does anybody have anything else before we move to adjournment? Yes, Jay. I'd like to recognize Alan very quickly. At the meeting we were yes. at a few weeks ago. thank you. At the meeting we were at a few weeks ago, Alan was recognized for his Ten years of service. Ten years of service yeah. to the so Board of Education. Congratulations. Thank you. Anybody else? All right, hearing none, do I have a motion to adjourn? Thank you, Jerry. Second, Christine. Any discussion? All right, all in favor? Great, thank you. Motion passes. We will see everybody next Monday night at 6.30. Here. Here.